Patrick Davison takes us into Second Life, where he tells us a tale of perception, grieving, and digital chickens. Ignite is an ongoing series of speedy presentations. They range from building multi-person pogo sticks to hacking chocolate. Any topic the geeks hold dear. Each speaker gets only five minutes and 20 slides at auto advance every 15 seconds. The talk you're about to hear was recorded live at one of the featured Ignite events around the world. Hi, uh, that's not how you spell my name. So I want to talk to you guys tonight about chickens, but not just any chickens. Uh, scion chickens, which are a particular breed of digital chicken, which you can only find on Second Life. Um, and it's a complicated story. Now, for those of you that don't know, Second Life is basically the real-world equivalent of Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. Uh, you can make a digital avatar for yourself and walk around and interact with other digital avatars and even own digital property like chickens. Um, but there's a bit of an identity crisis on Second Life. Some people would call it uh, nothing more than a chat interface with a really fancy visualization, while other people would argue that it's more of a massively multiplayer online RPG with no goal or rules or points. Um, but all that we care about is that it's the only place in the world you can buy a Scion chicken, right? Now the Scion chickens themselves have some pretty interesting characteristics. Uh, they have a lifespan of about a year, unless you hit them or starve them, which you can do, uh, and they come in different colors, which means that if you have two chickens of a different color, you can breed them to make a third new color. Uh, and this is actually pretty interesting because it means that a second economy has developed where breeders will buy tons of chickens and use them to make new rare colors that they then sell to second or third generation chicken owners, which seems to be a pretty good system, especially when you consider this guy, Sion Zayas. Ding. He's the guy who sells the chickens, but not only the chickens, but the chicken feed that every single chicken, first, second, or third generation, requires to live. So needless to say, he's got a bit of a racket going. I found out about these Scion chickens not from buying them, but from this article. Second Life's chicken farming community is facing a deadly new threat of food decoy that distracts virtual chickens from their food trays, starving them to death over the course of several days. The threat of biological warfare marks the latest stage in the ongoing conflict between chicken farmers and anti-chicken residents. What is going on? So I emailed Pixeline Mistral, who is the managing editor of the blog where that appeared, and I said, what's going on? And Pixeline was happy to respond and email me and tell me the story. But before we get to that, I want to show you the beginning of her email. <laughs> so we'll get back to this in a second. But basically, she told me that the chickens became popular, right, among first generation and then second generation buyers. But the problem is, is that these chickens, you can breed them, right? But if you leave them on their own, they can breed themselves. So the estimates I found put the total chicken population somewhere around 100,000 chickens at its peak, right? And because they're so robustly simulated, that means if you get enough of them in the same place, the server begins to slow down. So what was happening with buyer warfare was that other Second Life users were just trying to kill the chicken plague to take back their servers. Well, of course, the chicken owners were pissed off about this because it's their private property. And once a band of griefers from Woodbury College figured out that people were pissed about chicken killing, they just started killing them just to get a reaction. And once another group of people figured out that Woodbury College was targeting chickens, they started buying chickens just to get them killed by Woodbury College so they could complain to Linden Lab, who runs Second Life, right? It seems weird, but it's not without precedent. In 1998, Julian DeBell published A Rape in Cyberspace, which is an article which details a conflict which happens on Lambda Mu, which is sort of like a text-only version of Second Life, okay? In it, a, a, a sexual deviant performs these sexual acts in a public space. And at the end of the story, it turns out that this person, who was actually run by a collection of college students, said that he did what he did because he saw Lambda Mu as a space for social experimentation and nothing more. Okay, so let's go back to the chickens and Pixeline's email. So this is the essence of Second Life? Factions fighting each other? How is that possible? Well, 
it's not so unreasonable when you think about the parties involved and think about the way that they perceive the function of the system in which they operate. So for Sion Zaius, Second Life is nothing more than a casual marketplace to make a buck. And for the griefers from Woodbury College, it's a game, but a game that they define the rules for. And Lambda Moo was just a space for social experimentation. But what about the chicken owners? For them, Second Life is like their home, a place for them to raise their pet. And Lambda Moo, for Julian DeBell, is a safe place to congregate his friends. And we obviously saw that Pixeline views Second Life just as valid as a real space. So after all of this researching the chicken problem, the question that I've come to be forced to ask is, how do I perceive the function of the platforms I use online? And to what degree does this perception of a function lead to the conflicts that arise there? Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.